اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين ابي القاسم محمد واهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين اذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى وقوله الحق وهو اصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا نجزين الذين اصطبروا اجرهم باحسن ما كانوا يعملون صلى الله محمد وعلى محمد سلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته um the ayat which i recited for tonight's discussion is from chapter known as surah an-nahl ayat number 96 portion of that ayat but the inspiration is from the dua which is recited on daily basis um dua which is recited on the 13th night in fact of ramadan uh where it is you know coming from a masoom which says allahumma tahirni fihi min ad-danas al-aqdar wa sabbirni fihi ala kainat al-aqdar wa waffiqni fihi lit-tuqa wa suhbat al-abrar bi'awnika ya qurrat ayn al-masakin where we make this dua that oh allah on this day please purify me against filth and dirt and grant me on this day steadfastness steadfastness against vicissitude of time and lead me on this day to piety and and companionship of the upright ones out of your assistance or oh, the delight of the poor ones with this dua and this ayat that i recited i'm sure it makes sense that the discussion will be slightly in reference to sabr when we look at this concept of sabr it is so close to this month of ramadan in fact when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to in quran in surah baqarah when he says wastainu bis sabr wa salat fa innaha la kabiratun illa ala al khashi'in that seek assistance from sabr and salat indeed it is a difficult task uh, except for those who are humble we find that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us if you are uh, feeling down and if you are in need of assistance and if something can provide assistance to you you go after the salat and you go after this fast and the word sabr in refer um, in this ayat refers to the fasting um that we perform during the month of ramadan and fast outside of the month of ramadan therefore it is very um you know it's not against the aqaid and the nobody should call it to be shirk that when someone says oh you're asking from assistance from someone other than allah you know asking for assistance from someone other than allah is shirk because in surah fatiha allah says iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in that it is you whom we worship and it is you whom we seek assistance from therefore if you ask from anyone aside from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then you are committing shirk therefore if you say ya ali madad or you ask for tawassul and shafaat of masumin then you are doing shirk you should ask directly from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now there are many ways of answering this and tackling this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have easily inspired every single one of us with the knowledge that he sent through his prophets but instead he chose this means that through the prophets not one not two not 100 not 200 124000 of them to come and deliver that same message which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the first one and that is believe in one god and believe in his prophethood and believe in the hereafter but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent why so that they become means between him and mankind in fact when there wasn't a mankind a human um you know as far as the bandegane khuda and the servants of allah on the face of the earth allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the first creation was his nabi so the guidance was sent prior to the creation of those who are in need of this guidance so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have easily inspired every single one of us with the knowledge with the ilm with the belief but he chose the other way around he chose to send his um, messengers and his representatives 
so that they may deliver this message to us. When Allah is using this means, although he is in no need of any means whatsoever, why is it that we are avoiding this means to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to refer back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this is where Quran talks about waqtaghu ilayhi al-wasila, that seek wasila to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you go through this wasila, then there are more chances of your success than if you were to go without this wasila, because your actions are not nearly enough. So someone would say, well, you know, Allah says, you should not ask from anyone. You know, when Allah set these parameters, when he said, ask, uh, it is you we pray and it is you whom we seek assistance from, which is when Allah says it is you, when Allah were saying this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we repeat that every time we stand up for salat because this is part of Surah Fatiha. We're reaffirming this concept. But right away in the very next chapter, Surah Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, bis sabr was salat. And seek assistance from sabr and seek assistance from salat. So right away, is it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's breaking the law that he created earlier on? Or na'udhu billah, you know, shouldn't even be saying that, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got some bada that he did not know na'udhu billah before. Now he's, no, that is not the case. That when we ask from something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is always with the intention that that thing or that someone has been vested uh, with the authority by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore they have the ability to listen to us and take our, you know, cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what the concept is. And it is totally in line with wahdaniyat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore if someone says, Ya Ali Madad, it's not that they are creating Ali to be, na'udhu billah, um, parallel to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as far as madad is concerned. No. Rather, Ali is the one who is standing up in worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ali is the one who is standing up in mihrab, praying in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, Ali is someone who was martyred in the halat of ruku, in the halat of sajda, uh, in the halat of namaz rather. And Ali ibn Abi Talib is someone who is the one uh, who is the standard bearer as far as Tawheed is concerned. So no, there is no uh, contradiction from that aspect if you were to go ahead and ask through Masumin alayhim salatu wasalam. As it is the case that you can ask through these different acts of worship. You know, when you stand up for salat, you're using this salat as what means to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you perform this fast, you're using this fast, this obligation, this ibadat, even if it's not an obligation, if it's just being done, um, you know, out of istihbab, you're still, you know, through this uh, fast, you are, um, you know, seeking assistance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but through this fast. So this wasila, it's not uh, like creating a parallel to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather it is a step getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, O oh Allah, keep me purified from filth and evil on this day and give me patience over your decrees. It is important that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed, if we are able to portray patience and display sabr in front of it, give me tawfiq to be in the company of the righteous people. That's also a very, you know, don't look at these du'as without understanding and just saying, you know, reciting because this dua is mentioned for this day this dua is mentioned for that day so i have to recite all of these duas but not even understand what this dua what i'm asking in this dua so you're making this dua imagine i'm sure many of you have recited it every year you make this dua and you say you know allahumma wafiqni fihi li tuqa wa suhbat al abrar oh allah give me tawfiq and uh, to be in the company of the righteous and help me become muttaqi but Right after making this dua, we are in the company of those who are not righteous. Right after making this dua, we go out and we show that we are the opposite of what dua we just made. Right after making this dua, we do an action which leads us away from being muttaqi. Right after doing this, we do something which, uh, making this dua, we do something which is opposite to, you know, being patient over the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We start complaining. We start making excuses. We start blaming. And where did this patient go? So you just made this dua that Allah give me patience in front of your decrees, in front of your orders, in front of your commands. 
And then right after making this dua, I'm challenging the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, this person has failed to understand the kalam of Masum and the words that he's or she is uttering in order to make this dua. So what is patience? <coughs> patience, um, it is a steadfastness. You know, one of the ways of explaining it, uh, it is a steadfastness. It is itminan, you know, this, uh, this yaqeen that you have, this satisfaction that you have, uh, and not becoming anxious in front of masayib and calamities. Now, it's very easy said than done. That how is it possible for anyone not to display uh, displeasure when they are facing masayib and they're facing calamities? Just take, you know, for instance, the time that we are going through, the difficulty that we are facing as a, a community, as a nation, you know, um, as the, you know, worldwide we're facing this, uh, this, this phenomena. We're all in it together. So many of us, you know, Alhamdulillah have been, um, you know, lucky enough to, um, you know, keep ourselves away from areas and places where it is possible to get sick. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, hopefully it remains that way. But many of us have not been so lucky. But still, regardless of that fact, if any musibah calamity has come upon us, uh, we have not lost our hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is one of the best signs, uh, our biggest signs of a uh, mu'min, that they don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what the translation of the word patience literally is then. It's steadfastness, it's minan, and not becoming anxious in front of the masaib and the calamity. It has many types. Patience in front of anger, which is in the form of forbearance. Patience in battlefield, which is in the form of your bravery. Patience against sinning, which is in the form of chastity. Patience in front of worship, ibadat, which is in the form of obedience. And patience against the world and the thing that it has to offer to you, which is asceticism or zuhud. So there are different types of patience that exist. Um, and all each and every single one of them are worthy of discussion and that is why you know there is a superior reward for those who display it and that's the ayat that i recited in the beginning from surah nahal ayat number 96 that we will surely give those who are patient their reward according to the best of what they used to do this is the reward that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking of that those who displayed patience in front of whatever that fell up in front of them. So how do we um, comprehend this, this sabr? Uh, what is the example of this sabr? Can there be an analogy which explains this sabr to us? There are many. I'll just give you one. Insan is like a patient, marid, right? And Allah is tabib. Allah is your, you know, ultimate healer, uh, Allah is your physician, he's your doctor, he's, he's your tabib. That's the word that is used in the kalam of Masun. Antum al marda wallahu kat tabib. So if I'm translating the word tabib as the doctor, uh, don't take it out of context that the Mawlana just called Allah a doctor. No, that's what the word is. In fact, you could derive from this that the work that the doctors and the physicians are doing or they do as a profession or in their profession, is the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's to give hayat to people. It's to look after the people. So therefore, may it be, that is the reason Masum is calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be tabib. Antum kal marza wallahu kat tabib. That you are like patients, you know, those who are marid, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a tabib, like a doctor. So, insan is like a patient in a hospital, and God is like a doctor. If the patient wants to heal and get better, he must listen and pay attention to the recommendations of the doctor patiently. So you and I in this world, we are patients of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we are suffering, and if we want to you know, come out of this suffering and want to heal, then we have to listen to the commands and the decrees of the doctor, the ultimate doctor, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's how you understand the concept of patience in front of the calamities that fall. 
that these calamities are actually, um, you know, I want to use the word gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he tests you. You know, um, a lot of time the pain that you suffer, uh, pain is actually a mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You say, hold on a second. If I'm paining somewhere, if I'm feeling pain in my body, how could that be mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Very easy. If you didn't feel the pain, then you won't be able to go after the cure and you won't even worry about healing it. The fact that you feel the pain, you look for a cure and you get after getting it fixed, right? The moment you feel, you know, for example, some of the signs of heart, uh, you know, this, this illness, this COVID-19, and a lot of people are, you know, walking around without any symptoms, right? Uh, that's even dangerous. You don't know what the signs are. You don't know if the, you don't have those signs. You're not showing any of those signs. That's actually worse because you could be an active car carrier of this virus, yet you have no idea. But if you are coughing and if you are having trouble breathing and you, know, you have fever, fever and you're shivering and, uh, you know, again, as I said, uh, trouble breathing, some of the signs that have been mentioned from the very beginning, then these signs are actually going to lead you to go ahead and worry about it and get tested. But if you don't have any of these signs, in that scenario, you know, even the facilities might not even test you. And therefore, you can't tell. So this pain is actually what? Mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It brings you out of heedlessness. When you become heedless, it brings you out of it. This pain tells you to go ahead and do something about it. So look at this pain from the aspect of what? From the aspect of being the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, go back to that discussion that Allah is your tabib and you are marid. If he is giving you troubles and there's painful things that are coming in front of you, look at those things as what? As mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't discard them right away saying that how unlucky I am. So what is the philosophy of this sabr? All the positive things face up to obstacles. You name any positive thing, and you will find an obstacle that it is facing. Positive and important things always have some sort of opposition. Freedom, you know, there's an opposition to that. Independence, there's an opposition to that. Faith, piety, acquiring knowledge, earning halal cannot be achieved without opposition. Now, how difficult it is for you to earn halal, how challenging it is for you to earn halal. Many of us may not realize this. But a lot of those people who work in different industries is challenging. You know, they can earn a dime without having to do something which is questionable. Therefore, it is, you know, always achieved. Uh, there's always an opposition to it. So if one cannot practice sabr and do not have means to stand against opposition, they should never step into this valley. But that's not how it works. You know, this is a story of one of the maraji. Um, and you, you probably know because this is a common thing now that our, all of our maraje, they receive food and people come and see them on daily basis. You know, um, uh, for example, at Sistani, if you go there, um, you know, there's a waiting list, but you get opportunity to see him. You can go as a group and every day, uh, maybe not, not in these conditions, but every day uh, there are people who from all over the world who are coming to visit him. So at the same time, they also receive a lot of, you know, letters from people, those who can't make it there. So you can write a letter to your marzo. Um, they also receive complaints sometimes, you know, uh, from, from different places where they have their representatives. You know, people write up letters saying that, you know, you have a representative over here, but I haven't been taken care of. For example, there was a need and so on and so forth. Nonetheless, there was a marja of our time. He received a letter from a person in which that person had used foul language, bad language towards this murder. Um, such bad language that, you know, you can't even face an individual after this person has read this. Now, due to his personal financial condition, that person was suffering and going through. He had blamed the murder for his struggles and 
lack of help from the office of Marja. This alim, this Marja, took the letter and placed it behind the books in his library so that you know no one will notice it. And uh, so that this person won't feel ashamed. He then wrote a letter to this person stating, it seems that you had written a letter to me, but unfortunately, it was thrown away. I didn't get a chance to read it. Please come in to see me so that we can discuss your problem. That man came in, got his affairs sorted out, and left without any shame for what he had said to the marja. You know, this is the absolute height of sabr. You know, someone uh, uses bad language with us, curses, for example, or whatever, right away, you know, I'm going to start um, a fist fight with this person, right? I'm not even giving an example of mara, uh, masumin. Those are even at the highest level, another standard. Now, this is a person, this is a person who's a knowledgeable person, but he's a human being like you and I. He's not masum. Yet the level of his patience is what? That this person has written him the worst possible words, cussing him out and using this foul language. But instead of showing any sort of anger, he writes back saying that it seems that you may have written a letter to me, but it was thrown away, could not read what you had said in it. And therefore, please come and see me um, because I don't know what it is that you want. This man comes in, knows that the merger did not read what, he, what I had written. So he does not feel any shame and he does not feel fearful that if he had seen what I had written in it, how would they deal with me? But this is showing the level of the um, you know, patience of this murder. So that's number one, that when we speak, the philosophy of Sabr is that every positive thing faces up to its obstacles. <coughs> number two, principally speaking, the world is filled with bitter and sweet incidents. Success and failures, wins and losses, not everybody is going to win. Some people will lose. Every day someone from our friends, from our family, from our neighbors, from, you know, back home, we hear some terrible news of someone, God forbid, you know, gets into an accident, someone passes away. And these days, it seems like you're hearing this news every day that so-and-so passed away, so-and-so passed away. And because we're so close-knit uh, community, when we hear about someone passing away, you know, it affects us. We feel about it. And if we lose hope, then we can't survive. You know, even with all of these calamities that are happening, you can't sit idly and say, well, you know, I'm done. I have no hope whatsoever. No. La tayasu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran that don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mankind is alive due to hope. A hopeless person is not even alive. That's how we re re refer to it. Number three in philosophy of this uh, sabr is seeking knowledge is a fruit of sabr. In Surah Shura, verse number 32, after having mentioned the signs or his signs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Very, um, you know, profound, unusual ayat that he uses two sifat which are of, you know, Superlative degree. Sigha Mubalaka. After mentioning all of his signs, he says, In the Fidalika, in these, you know, signs of ours, there are signs for those who are who sabbar and shakur. Not just sab sabir. Sabir is someone who's patient. And shakir is someone who's thankful. No, sabbar and shakur. I'll translate. Secrets of creation are signs of Allah. Uh, and knowledge about them requires sabr, that to the highest degree of sabr. That's what Allah subhanahu wa sabbar, sigha mubalika. The one who's excessively patient and the one who's excessively thankful. So in order to learn patient and steadfast, we must study the lives of Masumin, alayhi wa wasalam. You know, there are so many stories in this reference that we find from um, Masumin, for example, or second imam, Imam Hassan al Mushtaba alayhi salatu was salam. That famous story that Imam was going through a place where he runs into uh, this man from Balad al Sham. 
you know, from Dimashq, from Sham, this man who grew up in the time of Amir Sham, only to learn how to hate Ahlul Bayt. And then this man, you know, while he, he, he's seeing Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, he sees Imam and he uses the same bad words to Imam. To Imam. But how does Imam respond to him? Imam must have had companions. They would have said, oh, Imam, we'll take this man out. He's using bad words against you. That's what the followers do. Instead, Imam stopped. He let him finish. Let this man say whatever he wanted to say. Let him empty out. And then Imam said to him, seems that you are from out of town. It seems that you are a stranger to this town. And as a stranger, you're probably looking for a place to stay. My place is available. As a stranger, you know, you might be in need of food. I can offer you food. And you might be in need of other wasail and other resources because you're a traveler. First of all, how did Imam understand? Because anyone who was local would not be saying these things to Imam, even if they were enemies. Secondly, this man was from outside. Imam knew that especially from that place where they used to curse. Yes, they used to use sabbu shitam on Masumi and Ahl bayt This man, looking at this character of Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba, it changes his mindset completely. He said, I've been fed something else while you guys are something else. And right away, this was the deep impact that Imam had on this person. Just by displaying sabr, Imam could have easily responded. What would have happened? Imam would have responded. If, you, if it was you and I, we would have responded with a bigger insult to that man. And that man would have run away. And we wouldn't have seen him again. But Imam changed that person right away. How? By a few moments of sabr, the man used insult to Imam. Imam remained silent. Let him say what he wanted to say. And then responded in a positive way. And when he responded in a positive way, you saw the results and the fruits that it produced. So that's why we see that in order to learn sabr, you know, you can read all the books you want to. You can learn all the philosophies of it you want to. I can say and give you lectures after lectures on sabr. You know, even if I was to speak 30 nights about sabr, I would still not run out of the amount of ahadith uh, and the traditions we have from Masumin. But the best way is to practically learn something. You know, knowing something and practicing it just the same way you and I practice the hunger of those who are underprivileged. You and I are practicing it, right? In this month of Ramadan. At the end of the day, that's when you realize how those people go through it every single day, those who don't have enough food. So we learn it, we're realizing it practically. This is the best way of learning anything. You want to learn a new language? Go live in that place where the people speak that language. You want to learn um, Arabic? Go live in an Arab country. You want to learn Persian? Go live in a Persian-speaking country. Go live in an Iran. You want to learn Urdu? Go live in, you know, where they speak Urdu, Pakistan or India, wherever they may. That would be the best way of learning. Yes, you can attend a college, university, take classes over here. You might learn the grammar, but the be, to be able to speak fluently the way the locals speak, that's different. That could only be done by practice. So coming back to our topic, before I get away too much, in order to learn patience, is steadfastness, we must study the lives of Masumin. You know, Masumin are not around us, except uh, his hujjat, Ahru Zama, uh, Imam Mahdi Ajjal Allah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif, except him, we have not been, we have not lived in the time of Masumin. And therefore, we're not going to be encountering them. Therefore, we can't see. But these books are there to explain the lives of Masumin as just one incident that I mentioned in front of you from our second imam. Second, we can also learn a great deal from our scholars. You know, I just explained, I just, you know, mentioned that story uh, of that Marja Taqlid, how he dealt with his ego and did not respond using his ego, instead showed patience and how he was able to sort out the issues of his, you know, um, follower. 
and without making them feel bad. Either. So we can learn from the lives of our scholars as well. Or even not just religious, even secular, for example, anyone who has reached the heights of knowledge had to go through tremendous, tremendous patience. That's why we read in the Kalam of Amir Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib wasalam, He said when he's speaking about the attributes of those who are pious, he said, وَتَجَمُّلًا فِي فَاقَةٍ وَصَبَرًا فِي شِدَّةٍ وَطَلَبًا فِي حَلَالٍ Endurance in hardship and desire for the lawful. These are some of the attributes of those who are the pious one. Amongst the attributes of the pious is that they are very, they never, um, you know, uh, they are never after acquiring and accumulating too much, whether it's wealth or whether it's hoarding other things, especially when it's from the haram source. Even if they are given something as a gift, they are very careful about its source, lest it is from a haram source. Although if someone gives me from a haram source and I have no idea, then I, there's nothing upon me. So, uh, you know, it's halal for me. But they are very careful because that could also have impact and that will have impact on you, especially if it was emerging from a haram source. So one aspect that which becomes clear from this sentence is that pious is someone who's not lazy, you know, who's active, who's not just sitting around and waiting for the mercy of Allah and Allah will send his help uh, and I don't have to do anything. No. Allah does not like those who are lazy. In fact, they're highly active in attaining the wealth and the sustenance through halal means. Fundamentally, Allah has only ordained halal sustenance for his servants. Everything is created by him, but we are only supposed to utilize that which is halal. Um, that's why there's so many rivayat, so many ayat in this reference. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kulu min tayyibati wa amalu salihan. Oh mankind, eat what is lawful and pure for you on this land. And do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. Prophet here also mentions the three signs of a sabir. He said, sabir doesn't act lazily. He doesn't get annoyed. He doesn't complain to Allah. Three things. That Allah yaksal, he's not lazy. Allah yadjar, he doesn't get annoyed. And Allah yashku mir rabbihi. And he doesn't complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because a lazy person will trample the truth. He'll manipulate the truth. Oh, I didn't get up because of this. I didn't do this. You know, there'll be many excuses that will come. Annoyed person cannot be thankful. You spent all your time you know, being annoyed. How are you going to be thankful? And one who complained to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed disobeyed and rebelled because he is questioning the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Prophet very beautifully said, these are the three signs of sabr. Now, if you and I are sabirin, if you and I are those who portray sabr, let's just see if we have these three signs in us. Neither we're lazy, nor are we annoyed and lastly, we don't complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So different verses that point toward this fact. I recited one of them to you that how Allah is saying to mankind, eat what is halal and pure in the earth and do not follow shaitan's steps. So the mantuq of this ayah, the apparent meaning of this verse is, um, you know, telling us not to follow the steps of shaitan. But the mafhum and the implied meaning tells us how not eating halal results in following the footsteps of shaitan. Did we get that? I'll repeat. Mantuq, which is the apparent meaning of the verse, is apparent. But the mafhum, you know, that, that mantuq is very obvious. What you, I just recited the translation. Oh, mankind, eat what, is, eat what is halal, what is lawful, and do not follow shaitan's footsteps. That's easily understood. But the mafhum of this ayat is what? It's telling us that how not eating halal can result in following the footsteps of shaitan. Uh, there are many such instances in this reference, but I will uh, maybe share it at another time. 
Um, you know, there are so many examples that are available for us. So many um, examples from Masumin. And there was a story that I was reading of a woman, how she displayed the highest level of patience. And few women for that matter. And I'll conclude with this. First, this lady who set out to go to Hajj with her husband and with her brother. They left Baghdad. And as they were on their way, her husband, when they stopped at one of the, at the Euphrates, her husband fell in the Euphrates and he drowned and he died. They could have gone back home, but she said, no, we're going to go to Hajj. They continued their journey. And a short while later, her brother fell from the camel, the ride. And this is a true story. Fell from the camel and the ride and he died. And this has appeared in the stories of uh, Aulia. And then, so she, but she continued. She said, you know, I've set out to perform this Hajj. Because back in the day, when you would go to Hajj, you expect things like this to happen. So it did not deter her. She continued her journey. She arrives in Mecca. And when she puts on her ihram, or before arriving into Mecca, she puts on her ihram from Miqat. You know, there were bandits who stole her wasail and her things, that she, her belongings. Still, she said, well, I've come to visit the house of Allah. And as soon as she entered the city of Mecca, Haram, she wanted to enter the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Masjid al-Haram, or the Baytullah rather. She wanted to enter the Haram, the vicinity of the Haram. But she, you know, became what women do usually in once a month, uh, their cycle and she became najis and so she couldn't enter the haram of Allah she said oh Allah musibat after musibat came to me you know my husband died my brother died my stuff was stolen but still I was determined to enter your haram but now you have closed your doors to me that I can't even enter it so she had this sigh ah what am I going to do? And she said she heard a response. That glad tidings to you. There are thousands of hajis who have come to perform hajj. But none of their cries are heard. And none of their labbaik are responded to. Your labbaik is responded. In Allah, la yudiyo ajral. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not waste the, um, you know, the amal of those who are good doers. So your amal are accepted. Even if you do not get to enter my house, that's fine. But the fact that you remain sabira, you showed utmost patience, you know, your actions are accepted. Your amal are accepted. But thousands of people who are performing hajj, you know, I haven't accepted anything from them. In fact, their kalam and their labbaq has not even reached my barga. While your ah, your sigh reached my barga. That's the difference. So as long as a person shows patience. And that's why we remember Ummul Razaya. Ummul Musiba. You know, if someone was to say that Janab Janabe Zainab alayha, is the best example of patience, biggest example of patience, it would not be an understatement. While Masumin faced tremendous difficulties in their lives, Manan, when we see what is compiled in the life of Janab Zainab, that's why she received these titles of Ummus, Ummul Razaya, Ummul Masa. That from the very beginning, you know, after the tragic shahadat of her mother, in that fashion that she passed away, while Janab Zainab was still a child, and then living in that sort of like a lockdown situation where her father's right is usurped for 25 years. That's patience. Oh, father, why can't we just get out and do whatever? No, we have to live this way. And then facing the calamities after her father was martyred, the musibat that Imam Hassan and Mushtaba faced. And even further in Karbala, all of the masaib that she faced. But never do you see that she's complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
that she is getting annoyed with what is happening. And so she's displaying all of those signs that Rasulullah had mentioned in that hadith. And she sees the family members are killed in front of her eyes. They're butchered in front of her eyes. They're paraded from city to city. They're living in prisons. Yet, Umm al Masaib, Janabi Zainab, alayha, does not utter a word of annoyance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she was always thankful for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of the you know, blessings that she had been bestowed with. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq and ability and the patience to adopt the sabr in our lives. That this month of Ramadan gives us the tawfiq to be able to fully utilize this ability that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given each and every single one of us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to follow the footsteps and the teachings of Masumin alayhi wa wa salam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance and the zuhur of our awaited Imam. At the conclusion, I would ask you to please one more time um, recite Surah Fatha for the sponsors Marhumin, um, Mr. and Mrs. Hussein Ali Merchant, Mr. and Mrs. Ahmed Ali Merchant, Mr. and Mrs. Sajjad Hussein Merchant, Mr. and Mrs. Hussein Ali Birani, Mr. Masum Ali and Mrs. Masuma Ali. Mr. and Mrs. Nisar Hussain and Mr. and Mrs. Adil Nathani, a Surah Fatiha for all of their Mahomies. Surah Fatiha, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Rahman Rahim, Maliki, and Mahomies, and Yaqan Abdul Yaqan Islam. Ehdina Surat al Mustaqim, Surat al Lawina, and Amta Alayhim, or Eri al Mahubub Alayhim, or Al Dolin. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Kulu Allah, who had the law, so when they did it, they were in the middle of the world. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Kulu Allah, who had the law, so when they did it, they were in the ولم يكن له كفر عن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله عاد الله ثم لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفر عن هذا Also inshallah we'll conclude because it is Shab al with the recitation of Ziyarat al بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا نبي الله السلام عليك يا حبيب الله السلام عليك يا خيرة الله السلام عليك ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا بارث آدم صفة الله السلام عليك يا بارث نوح النبي الله السلام عليك يا بارث إبراهيم خليل الله السلام عليك يا بارث موسى كليم الله السلام عليك يا بارث عيسى روح الله السلام عليك يا بارث محمد حبيب الله السلام عليك يا وارف أمير المؤمنين ولي الله السلام عليك يا ابن محمد المصطفى السلام عليك يا ابن علي المرتضى السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة الزهراء السلام عليك يا ابن خديجة الكبرى السلام عليك يا ثار الله وابن ثاره والوتر الموتور أشهد أن قد قمت الصلاة وأتيت الزكاة ومرت بالمعروف ونهيت عن المنكر وطعت الله ورسوله حتى تاك اليقين فلان اللهم تن قتلتك ولان اللهم تن ولمتك ولان اللهم تن سمعت بذلك فرضيت به يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله أشهد أنك كنت نورا في الأصلاب الشامخة والأرحام المطهرة لم تنجسك الجاهلية بأنجاسها ولم تلبسك من مضلهم ما تثيا بها <تصفيق> وأشهد أنك من دعائم الدين وأركان المؤمنين وأشهد أنك الإمام البر تقي الرضي الزكي الهاد المهدي وأشهد أن الأئمة من ولدك كلمة التقوى وأعلام الهدى والأروة الوثقى والوجة على أهل الدنيا وأشهد الله ملائكته وأنبياءه ورسله أني بكم مؤمن وبيا بكم موقن بشراء ديني وخواتيم عملي وقلبي لقلبكم سلم وأمري لأمركم متبع صلوات الله عليكم وعلى أرواحكم وعلى سادكم وعلى سامكم وعلى شاهدكم وعلى غائبكم وعلى ظاهركم وعلى باطنكم بأبي أنت وأمي يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا غريب الغرباء السلام عليك يا مؤمن الضعفاء والفقراء السلام عليك يا شمس الشموس وعنيس النفوس أيها المطفون بعرض توسى لي ابن مفرضة ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا صاحب الأس والزمان السلام عليك يا إمام الإنس والجان السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن أجل الله تعالى وفرجك وسهل الله مخرجك وظهورك 
وجعلنا من اوانكم صالح رحمه الله وبركاته اللهم صل على محمد